Welcome to Pasadena Monthly. I'm your host, Justin Chapman. Thanks for being here for our very first episode in the studio. We've filmed this show virtually every single month since April 2021, and now we're so excited to get into the studio and up the game. It's a new chapter for this show. After taking a look at what's been going on in Pasadena this past month, we'll speak with our guest, Pasadena Police Chief Eugene Harris. But before we get started, let's check out these Pasadena Media News Briefs. Congresswoman Judy Chu presented Pasadena officials with a $900,000 grant check to help fund its support program, the city's substance abuse, housing, and mental health street outreach team. The congressional funding through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services will help fund the team through September 2024. Representative Chu presented the check at a ceremony in the Robinson Park Recreation Center in Pasadena with Mayor Victor Gordo, city officials, and port members in attendance, and had this to say about port. Port is a tremendous solution to the issue of homelessness because you are going right there to the street to make sure that those who are out there can get the help that they need. Created in 2018, the Pasadena Outreach Response Team uses a long-term approach to engage with people experiencing homelessness and offers a variety of services. To learn more about the PORT program, visit the city's website at cityofpasadena.net. Visit Pasadena has introduced its Cheeseburger Centennial Celebration, commemorating 100 years since the cheeseburger was invented in Pasadena. Throughout January 2024, stay in Pasadena and get a cheeseburger. Experience Cheeseburger Week, take a cheeseburger walking tour, and get cheesy offers by showing your Metro Tap card at participating restaurants. Cheeseburger Week returns January 21st through the 27th to celebrate the 100th anniversary. For more information, go to visitpasadena.com. This year marks the 140th anniversary of the Pasadena Public Library System. To celebrate, the library is planning a year-long celebration highlighting the past, present, and future through contributions of trailblazers, innovators, and future thinkers. We are excited to celebrate this milestone with our community and continue the tradition of offering impactful service to all, said Pasadena Public Library Director Tim McDonald. From January through October, the Pasadena Public Library will host a different feature program at each branch location and will release limited edition merchandise, launch a 14 book reading challenge, collect and feature community stories, and broadcast videos of interviews with library staff. Pasadena residents are invited to submit their stories for the library time capsule through the library's dedicated website. To submit a story, visit cityofpasadena.net slash library. Let's turn next to our lightning round of news updates. One, the city released language for three charter amendments that will be on the March 5th ballot, measures R, S, and T. If approved by the voters, the measures will correct outdated language regarding the annual transfer from the power fund to the general fund, set limits by ordinance for contract settlement and claim approvals, and establish an amendment for additional contract selection methods for capital improvement and infrastructure projects for municipal services. Meanwhile, the Community Police Oversight Commission is weighing whether to pursue a charter amendment on November's ballot to strengthen its oversight of the Pasadena Police Department by recommending changing from a police auditor to a police monitor system. The commission has also expressed interest in ex exploring obtaining subpoena power. The discussion will continue next month. Two, in its first meeting of the year, this week the City Council voted unanimously to adopt a $2.8 million operating budget for the new Rent Stabilization Department authorizing the department's new interim director, Philip LeClaire, to secure an office location, purchase furniture and technology, hire 12 full-time staff members, and establish a rental registry database by June. A new annual rental housing fee of $91.85 will be collected from Pasadena's 31,316 rental units to fund the budget. By 2025, the department anticipates a total of 22 staff members, a nearly $6 million annual budget, and a fee of $213 per unit. The council also approved a contract with 3DI Inc. for the implementation and maintenance of a rental registry. Meanwhile, the California Apartment Association said it expects to file its opening brief this month in its appeal of a judge's decision against their lawsuit challenging Measure H, 
the voter approved rent control law. The city will submit its own brief in March or April and a panel of three judges will hear oral arguments and decide the case. Three, Vroman's bookstore is going up for sale. Joel Sheldon, chairman and majority shareholder of Vroman's on Colorado Boulevard, Vroman's Hastings Ranch, and Book Soup in West Hollywood announced that there is no buyer yet, but that he does plan to sell all three stores. Sheldon and his family and team have shepherded Vroman's through numerous challenges over many decades, including the pandemic, changes in the publishing industry, and the shift to Amazon and other online booksellers, to name a few. The store was founded by Adam Clark Froman on November 14, 1894. He died in 1916 and left the store to his employees, including A.D. Sheldon, Joel's great-grandfather. And the Sheldon family have run the business ever since. At 130 years old, Froman's is truly a Pasadena institution, and I think just about everyone wants to make sure that it remains an independent bookstore well into the future. Four, the city has installed new plaques in Mills Place Alley in Old Pasadena, accurately describing the incident in 1885 when a white racist mob attacked and burned down a laundry at that location owned by Yuan Qi, a Chinese immigrant. The mob chased Chinese immigrants out of the city and anti-Chinese legislation soon followed. The story was first brought to light by my friend and local historian Matt Horman in a 2015 Pasadena Weekly story. It's a recognition 138 years in the making. But as the plaques say, Pasadena's march toward justice is not complete and must continue in each generation. Five, the Rose Bowl Aquatic Center announced that its recreational pool will be named after Dr. Edna Griffin, a social justice pioneer who served as the first black female president of Pasadena's NAACP branch and led the charge in desegregating the Brookside Plunge Municipal Pool in 1942. The city and the Aquatic Center will commemorate the pool's renaming in May. Six, the city council this week selected Perkins Eastman as the 710 Stub Master Plan Consultant. The master plan will serve as the guiding planning document for the future development of the area and the foundation for the creation of a new SR 710 Northern Stub Area Specific Plan. Currently, the relinquished area has no land use or zoning designations. The recently commissioned historic report on the 710 displacement will also be incorporated into the final master plan. The historical consultants will soon begin collecting data about and human stories from those who were displaced by the freeway decades ago. Seven, the Rose Bowl Operating Company and General Manager Jens Wyden are negotiating a restated and amended operating agreement with the city of Pasadena. In a separate action that would span the next 10 years, the Rose Bowl will seek approval to hold 25 displacement events per year rather than the current limit of 15. And those include music festivals, soccer games, and concerts. That would actually formalize what has already been happening as the city council has approved many one-off displacement events above the 15 in recent years. These items will likely come before the council in a couple of months. Meanwhile, the Rose Bowl announced that LA Galaxy and LAFC will return to the stadium on the 4th of July for a soccer game and fireworks show like last year. Eight, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory recently laid off 100 contractors and implemented a hiring freeze to reduce spending because the federal budget that Congress is currently working on, or not working on to be more precise, may cap uh, NASA's Mars sample return mission at $300 million instead of the $949 million requested by the Biden administration. NASA has ordered JPL to cease operations of that mission, which aims to bring pieces of Mars back to Earth by the end of January. The Mars sample return mission is a joint project with the European Space Agency and one of the biggest and most complex of JPL's missions, and the first of its kind. Local lawmakers call the decision short-sighted and misguided. Nine, Pasadena City College plans to reestablish its satellite campus in Rosemead, across the street from its former satellite campus, which closed last June after the El Monte Union High School District, which owned that property, ended the lease after PCC operated there for a decade. PCC moved forward with purchasing several parcels of land on Bentel Avenue in downtown Rosemead and entered escrow last month. PCC's previous satellite campus offered 120 courses per semester. The new Rosemead campus will include classrooms, science and computer labs, student services offices, a variety of educational opportunities, dual enrollment, and concurrent enrollment students from nearby Rosemead High School and outreach opportunities for students at Muscatel Middle School. And 10, 
LA County is reportedly discussing transferring ownership of Henninger Flats, a 230 acre parcel, 2,600 feet above sea level in the San Gabriel Mountains, back to the Tongva through a nonprofit called the Tongva Tarahat Pahava Conservancy, which was created in 2021 to receive back and steward lands in the greater LA basin. A separate group, the Gabrieleno Band of Mission Indians Keech Nation, which rejects the legitimacy of the word Tongva, has objected to the potential transfer of Henninger Flats to the Conservancy. Let's welcome our guest, Pasadena Police Chief Eugene Harris. You're our very first in-studio guest. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. Uh, chief has been Pasadena's top cop for just over a year. He, he, before that, he was the police chief of San Gabriel since 2016. He served as president of the LA County Police Chiefs Association, actively engaging in advancing the science and art of police administration and crime prevention. After serving uh, an honorable uh, uh, discharge from the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, Chief Harris began his career in law enforcement as an LA County deputy sheriff. He also served in, in, for 23 years in the Monterey Park Police Department, where he was promoted through the ranks to captain. So you, you've served in the police chief role here at Pasadena for one year. How's it going? What are your impressions? Uh, how does it compare, contrast to San Gabriel? Well, it's a little different, uh, as you might expect. Um, each city has, has its own personality. Uh, it has its own demographics, which bring its own challenges. And so here in Pasadena, uh, what I like, I term it as the, the attractive challenge. There are so many different um, challenges that come from uh, geography, from um, certainly the demographics, certainly the business uh, composition of the city. Um, there's a lot of everything here, up to and including um, some of the world-class things that we have to deal with, such as the Rose Bowl and you know that, that parade thing that happens here uh, at the beginning of every year. So um, Pasadena's definitely got its own thing going, but uh, I wouldn't be able to handle this without having having developed at, at San Gabriel. Uh, and and uh, what, what, what would you say your overall policing philosophy is? Are you, are you a, a broken windows guy, a community policing, something else? What, what's your, your, um, your overall philosophy and what's best for Pasadena? Well, I think the overarching position that I take is we have to develop community partnerships and that engages everyone. So everyone uh, that the police may encounter, including community members, uh, business folks, uh, visitors to the town. We want to make sure that we're engaging with those folks and making sure that we're establishing sound relationships. Um, that's really, really important because the business of police work, uh, other than you know legislative changes and things, doesn't change a whole lot. Um, police work, you have a 911 call, the police respond and we try to handle the call. But where it balances out and where it changes and becomes really special is in the development of the relationships. What's our relationship with the community? What's the community's relationship with our individual officers? And so that's where my focus is. Let's develop sound community partnerships and then we can teach the rest of it. Great, and you, you mentioned the Rose Parade. You just experienced your first parade as chief because um, I believe you started right after the first last year. Um, so anything in, in general you would adjust for next year or lessons learned? I believe there was a small amount of, of arrests, but there was one concerning incident where a woman tried to drive her car into a crowd, right? How, tell us about that. Well, interesting story, just as a little background. Uh, the city manager wanted to hire me in, in probably around December or so of 2022. And I, I wanted to make sure he understood that I had a little bit of intellect. So I said, uh, no thanks, can we do it the day after the parade? And he went along with it, so it worked out pretty well. I didn't want to be responsible for it on my first day. Uh, but uh, this is a, a major incident, a major issue here in Pasadena is that we have that every year um, and we have to plan for that every year. It's a major um, component of what makes Pasadena, Pasadena. And um, with that, although it's the same event, the Rose Bowl and the Rose Parade every year, it brings with it unique challenges every year. And so this year it had a brand new police chief just learning how to handle, um, you know, uh, events of that complexity and that size. Uh, we're trying to change some of the culture, cultural things within the department, and so we have to apply that as we're navigating this large event. Um, but it turned out and worked out very well. Uh, it was a great turnout, um, certainly indicative of the professionalism uh, within this organization and the city, citywide. Now, we did have a few incidents, but they were really minor. Uh, we had uh, one exception where uh, an individual tried uh, to drive a car past one of the barriers. Uh, whatever the intent was, uh, that's still under investigation. But the barriers, the physical barriers that were strategically placed performed their function well, uh, and we had no injuries uh, or any other incidents as a result of that. So uh, I think that our event planning section and the city's event planning uh, environment is second to none. They've been doing this for over 100 years, and it just does it the right way. Um, and, and you've talked about rebranding the department. What does that mean? What are your plans? When, do we, when will we see them roll out? 
we had a team building strategic planning workshop that brought all of the management and certainly some of the line folks together to try to decide what we needed Pasadena PD to look like. Uh, one of our commanders uh, came up with the term contemporary rebranding, and I don't think it could be put any better than that. We need to you know, move forward. Uh, there's a history in Pasadena, both with the police department and the city. Um, there, there's, you know, the current culture and the need to make adjustments so that we can move forward, learn from the past and, and make it different for Pasadenians and, and those folks living and working here. And so the contemporary rebranding piece um, simply means that we're going to find more progressive ways and in, in to, to really conduct our police service and really provide the knock your socks off service that this city deserves. And so it, it's the simple things from the outward appearance of, of our uniforms, changing the patches and changing the badge to represent our willingness to change, all the way up to and including um, organizational changes, such as the creation of our street crimes unit, which now kind of combines gang enforcement with our neighborhood action uh, component. So we're dealing with community while we're dealing with some of the gang issues or other street crime issues. And so we're dealing, a, it's kind of a street, street crime uh, element, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, a street crime element really attached with a community feel. So that's the goal, to try and find ways to do the things that need to be done, but do them in a way that is really respectful to the community and understands what the needs are. So some of those are the things you're going to see. We're really moving forward uh, from a technology perspective. Mm -hmm. One of the things we will no longer be is the agency of slow, and we won't be the agency of no. We're going to be the agency of go when it comes to identifying ways to better serve this community. And, and some of those changes, I imagine, are already underway. Yes. Um, Technology-wise, we're, we're getting a hold of technology such as the cell site simulator, which was just approved by the city council. Uh, we have uh, upgrades to ShotSpotter. We have our mobile command center, which allows us to do a lot of things, including data downloads and things that can help us do the job uh, much better um, than we've done in, in years past. And so we're working on really empowering the people in the organization to kind of bring some of that technology and really relying on the technology as we navigate the, the new millennium law enforcement. Gotcha. And, and, and how do you think the, the Community Police Oversight Commission and the independent police auditor roles are going so far? Is that the right model for Pasadena? What, if anything, should be changed? Well, I, I don't know about models. Uh, there are several models, whether you're an auditor or a monitor or different mm -hmm. types of ways that these things can be put into practice. But I will tell you that having three oversight bodies here, including the Independent Police Auditor, the Community Police Oversight Commission, and the Public Safety Committee, all of those are elements that might frighten you at first if you're coming into this business or part of this business as long as I have, where we didn't have those things. Uh, but it's absolutely crucial if we're going to establish that trust and transparency in the community to be able to work well together to really find solutions uh, for the things that we need to do in this in this community. So in relation to those three groups, I believe that the relationship is solid. We're working well to solve problems. Uh, I enjoy going in and making sure that we're talking about policies and oversight and the things that we need to put into place. So. Um, it's working well. Um, as far as models are concerned, I guess there's many different types of models. But again, it goes back to relationships. Mm -hmm. Are we having the relationships that can be effective in getting the things done? Yeah, and Dr. Ro Rosenthal, the, the uh, police auditor, had, had um, proposed the, the uh, police monitor role and the, the commission's looking at that. So you're saying you, you wouldn't have a preference either way you'd work with uh, whatever they decide to, to do? Well, I, I think preferentially I'd need to know more about it and what the monitor position is. I've mm -hmm. learned a lot over the last year of the auditor role. I'd lead to do my research on the monitor role. But I am not going to be a person who does things based on preference. I, I'm going to be a prim principle based decision maker. If principally for this community, that is a better way to go, then I'll support it. Um, we need to vet it and we need to look at how that's going to impact us, but it won't be a preference. Uh, there's a lot of things that I don't like. There's a lot of things I'd rather not do. Maybe there's some things I'd rather do, but the decisions uh, of leadership in this organization won't be made based on that. It will solely be about the principle and does it do what it needs to do to provide that service. And, and Dr. Uh, Rosenthal, the, the uh, police uh, auditor, he said, you know, the department's been working well with him, uh, you know, taking his recommendations seriously, working in good faith with him uh, on that. There's been collaboration and cooperation. Uh, there's one issue he raised is, is the timing of the clearance letter before the department conducts their own administrative investigation review of an incident and issues their own charging decisions. He says best practice is that the department should conduct their administrative uh, reviews in a timely manner, regardless of the DA's timing, particularly since the DA's taken several years for some of these uh, uh, de decisions to come out. What's your take on that? Is that something the department is considering? 
Well, he and I are debating whether or not that's the best practices from the different perspectives. He's seeing it from his perspective. Uh, I'm seeing it from the leadership and law enforcement perspective um, that I bring to the table. And so we may have be at odds at some of the, the specifics about how that happens. But with the recommendations that came through, um, I capitulated, certainly moved a little more toward the center in saying that I'll evaluate it on a case by case basis, um, as opposed to as some other uh, agencies have done, have said, we're only going to wait until the DA is done. We'll evaluate on a case by case basis based on certainly the merits of the case, the severity of the case, and certainly the elements that are present at that time. And then I'll make that decision. But the other piece that I added to it when we were doing the, the discussion on it was that I will provide a reason why I'm not doing it. Mm. Uh, if that's the case. So we, we're working well together to try to get things uh, in place, um, but there's some autonomy to how we're going to do this. And, and I reserve the right to kind of comment on that and, and move in the direction I think I need to move. Mm -hmm. and, and and what, if, if anything, uh, can you tell us about the, the lawsuits that were recently filed by uh, officers alleging racial discrimination, retaliation, some pretty serious allegations, but you said you looked into it and there's nothing to it. Well, um, the actual thing that came out was talking about violence and assaults within the organization. And when I came out to the public, I simply wanted to reassure them that there was no violence or assaults going on within the organization. Um, the other details of the of, of the claims I can't discuss because sure. it's ongoing, uh, potential ongoing litigation and certainly personnel matters that are attached. So I can't discuss those in detail. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to make sure that it was clear that I, I said to the public and to the people inside the organization that there are there's no violence on behalf of command staff within our organization. Gotcha. And uh, what would you say the department can do better and what do they not get credit for? Well, uh, we did a year end uh, report that I gave to CPOC uh, in first week in January, I think it was. And uh, we talk about the things, lessons learned, the things that we don't do well and some of the things that we can look forward to that we do strong in the mm -hmm. future. One of the things is I think that we are stuck in a place sometimes of historical paralysis where we don't think that we can change and we're constantly living in a place that you know, however many years ago there's, there's a problem. Uh, and so people believe that that problem still exists just simply by virtue of it having existed. Yeah. My feeling is that we need to move forward and find ways to solve those problems, learn from them, admit that they existed, but also admit that we could be in a different place. And I absolutely believe that culturally this department is in a different place today than it was then. Um, there are a lot of uh, external components to people who have the right to believe what they want to believe and have their opinions. Uh, but from inside the organization, we're watching the change. We're watching uh, the ability to kind of redo and reconfigure the way that we conduct our police service um, and making sure that we uh, allow for di diversity, equity, and inclusion and all the, the elements of, of really new millennium policing. Um, one element to that is if you take a look at that year-end report, it should be posted online. We talk about all of the elements of, of trying to uh, really get a command staff and a leadership team that understands all of those elements so that we're trickling all of that information throughout the organization. And I think we're being very successful at that. Great. And finally, uh, what are some of the most pressing issues that the department is working on? And, and you know, what should the community uh, be aware of? And how can we partner with the, the police department? Well, policing is challenging simply from um, the, the fact that um, times are changing. So um, as times change, police work has to change, police interactions and relationships have to change. Um, there's always new legislation at the beginning of every year. We have to go and retrain folks on things that are coming down. But um, I think the most challenging part facing Pasadena PD is really the recruitment retention part of getting people that want to do this job. I remember when I came into this job, um, there were, you know, we'd have two or three positions and five or 600 applicants. Um, that has flipped. You know, we have two or three positions and now we've got four or five, maybe 15, 20 applicants. And that is a problem for everybody. <clears throat> but in a city this size with the complexities, we need to be able to turn people around, hire really qualified people and meet all of our, our needs um, in a very quick uh, fashion or big, quick turnaround. And so I think that's a problem because we constantly have to be worried about getting qualified and quality personnel mm -hmm. while meeting all the other needs that we have for diversity, equity, inclusion, um, people that have uh, solid backgrounds. The background investigation sometimes creates issues. You might take even the marijuana issue, right, where the state of California has said, OK, marijuana is legal, but the United States federally, it says it's still illegal. Mm -hmm. You can imagine the number of challenges that creates when we're trying to hire folks. And so. Um, I think that that recruitment and retention is a significant issue. Uh, the other part of it is um, 
the, the world of crime and the world of crime fighting is changing. There are different expectations. And so with the advent of technology and the quickness with which these things change, we have to be able to be really nimble in the way that we conduct our business. And we haven't been successful at that uh, as a whole in law enforcement. Um, really making ourselves so we can make those changes rapidly and start doing it the way that, you know, we have to work when interacting with the public. So uh, we're working at getting those things done, increasing and improving our training segment. Uh, I, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Great. Well, Pasadena Police Chief Eugene Harris, thank you so much for uh, coming in and being our, our first in-studio guest. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us about your work at the department. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before we go, here is This Month in Pasadena History. It was this month in 1978 when the first Doodah Parade was held in Pasadena on New Year's Day. That year, January 1st fell on a Sunday, so the Rose Parade was to be held on the following day. Several friends hanging out in Cromo's Bar in Old Pasadena, including Peter Appinell, Ted Wright, Charles Skip Finnell, Corky Peterson, Richard Caputo, and Alice McIntosh, decided to launch their own parade that would be the opposite of everything the Rose Parade stood for. The uh, Doodah Parade began at Pasadena Avenue and Green Street and marched down Colorado and then up Raymond to Memorial Park. The first Doodah Queen was Dorothy Romani, known as Queen of the Stardust Ballroom. The first Grand Marshal was Corky Peterson, the original owner of Chromos. Peter Appenell became the czar and organizer of the occasional parade for many years. Then starting in 1994, Tom Costin's Lightbringer Project began producing the parade, which it does to this day. What began as a satirical alternative to the Rose Parade has become a revered local tradition. Thank you all so much for joining me for this episode of Pasadena Monthly with Justin Chapman, our very first episode in the studio. Tune in every fourth Friday of the month at 5 p.m. and learn more at PasadenaMedia.org and JustinDouglasChapman.com. Drop me a line at jchapman at cityofpasadena.net. We'll see you next time. Thank you.